entertainment. From a tiny garage to large palatial studios and exotic theaters. Now, in the 21st century, radio's back, if you only know where to find it. Mystery Play Internet Radio is your source for old-time radio. Let's listen to what a few of the participants had to say about radio. There never was a community of people who got together and said, why don't we have a theater? We need a theater. Where are the actors? That never happened in the history of the world. A few hams got together and said, let's get up on the stage and do something. In the cave, somebody stood up and told a story. Nobody said, let's have a story until they'd heard a story. I still think radio is probably the greatest entertainment medium ever invented. It made the audience work. And I think television audiences don't have to work, and that's why they fall asleep half of the time. <laughs> Origination um, oh, came out of Chicago. Oh, probably, probably more network shows uh, uh, came out of Chicago than came out of New York at that time. I'm talking about the early 30s. We had, you, you know, oh, gee, some of the biggest accounts that we had. Whiteman, for instance, came from there. Uh, uh, the Carnation Hour came from there. Almost every soap opera came uh, came from Chicago. What was the name of the agency? Blackett, Sample, and Hummert, I believe. They had accounts, and they were all out of Chicago, every one. I, there were times in Chicago, if I remember numbers correctly, I think I used to do something like 26 to 28 shows a week. Uh, it was the beginning of everything. Uh, all the sound effects were manual, and you had to have a man with, with any imagination that would, would be able to create these things. And they did them with every strange kind of uh, device that you could think of. You sure. know, Empire Builders were a uh, stickler for the, for the uh, sound of the train. So they went to this extent. They had a, uh, a track built, a circular track, that I would guess would have been about five feet in diameter. And the rails... Uh, were exactly, the cracks in the rails were exactly as they were on the regular. Uh, uh. They had little weighted cars that they would put on these things that were uh, controlled electrically to go at the speed so that the clicks would be exactly as a, the same as they were for a passenger train and exactly the same as they were for a freight train. And on the roof outside where they had a microphone that they could open up, they had all the whistles. Out there, they had the uh, the ding dongs of the of the cross the crossings that you'd go through. Mm -hmm. They would fade it in, you know, the ding dong, and fade it out as it would go. You know, the whistle would do the same thing. They had a microphone way at the top of a uh, of a funnel shaped affair for these clicks that that came in the thing with a microphone facing down to pick these up. And now, let's listen to a few clips from radio programs from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. of Campbell Soup presents the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Orson Welles. The late William Archer was as formidable a gentleman as you would wish to meet. From 1884 to 1923, he wrote dramatic criticism for almost every important paper in England. And almost every American and English playwright at one time or another winced beneath his pen lashings. Then later in life, he developed a secret passion, a disgraceful passion for a dramatic critic. He wanted to write a play. Mr. Archer was a very thorough old gentleman. The first thing he did was to write a book in which he explained exactly and in great detail how plays should be written. It became a classic. No young playwright since then would dream of writing a play without carefully consulting and following the rules and dictates laid down by Mr. William Archer. 
No young playwright, that is, except Mr. William Archer, who at the age of 63 sat down and wrote a play in which he took care to break every single one of the rules that he'd set down in his manual. It was called the Raja of Rook. It was changed to the Green Goddess. Opened on December 27th, 1920 at the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia with Mr. George Arliss in the leading part and was an immediate and overwhelming success. Ladies and gentlemen, it only remains for me to tell you that our guest tonight is the star of such fine motion pictures as The 39 Steps, The General Dies at Dawn, The Prisoner of Zenda, and the new Paramount Picture Cafe Society, the beautiful and talented Madeline Carroll. But before we begin, a word from Ernest Chappell. Did you lose an election bet yesterday? Feel a bad cold coming on? Want to get away from it all? We offer you escape. You were groping in the midnight dimness of a gigantic department store. And suddenly you realize that you're not alone... But a hundred eyes are glaring at you from the shadows. A hundred hands reaching for your throat. And your most urgent desire is to escape. Escape. Produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And carefully plotted to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. The Johnson Wax Program with River McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Marion and Jim Jordan as Fibber McGee and Molly with Bill Thompson, the King's Men, and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with you. That's the gallop. Captain Lee Quinn. Specially transcribed tales of the dark and tragic ground of the wild frontier. The saga of fighting men who rode the rim of empire. And the dramatic story of Lee Quinn, Captain of Cavalry. Good evening, friends of the creaking door. This is your host to welcome you once again into the inner sanctum. Come in. Come in and meet our newest guest. He'd been married for ten years and everything was going fine until one night at dinner his wife asked him to pass the knife, which he did, right through her. Then he hid her body in the town bell. That's where he made his mistake because the next morning she uh, told on him. <laughs> and now we can turn to a little matter of murder. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. 
the story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. If you've enjoyed what you've heard so far, please become a patron of Mystery Play Internet Radio. Here's how you do it. You go to www.patreon.com slash mpir. That's patreon.com slash mpir. Become a patron of Mystery Play Internet Radio. Now, when you subscribe, you can use your email address and any amount of money that you're willing to throw at me will be greatly appreciated. I really need your support to help Mr. Play Internet Radio continue. Please, will you consider becoming a patron of Mr. Play Internet Radio? Thank you so much for listening and watching.